For decades, thousands of native-born Americans have been leaving the U.S. to make new lives in foreign lands. Some left for adventure. Think of the Americans in Paris in the 1920s. Ernest and Hadley Hemingway, for instance, or Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. Others left to avoid racism. Think of singer Josephine Baker or author James Baldwin. Still others moved to find a cheaper cost of living, moving to countries such as Mexico or Costa Rica. But this story is about two expats who left for love, two cousins. Ryan Irwin of Durham, North Carolina, moved to Germany in 2005 to be with his girlfriend, Julia Monica. Ryan is restoring historic boats in the harbor city of Hamburg. He and Julia are no longer a couple, but they remain good friends. Courtney Ann Irwin of Shreveport, Louisiana, moved to the Netherlands in 2010 to join her fiancé, Marnix Ventur. They fell in love after Marnix heard Courtney Ann playing the piano in the lobby of a Houston hotel. She's been studying Dutch while working as a marketer for a biotech firm in Amsterdam. I know their stories well. Ryan is my younger son, Courtney Ann, my niece. I admire their spirit, leaving the familiar behind, plunging into a new culture. Slowly but surely, they're becoming Europeans. Über Weihnachten habe ich versucht herauszufinden, was mit dem Boot meines Opas passiert ist. How did I get interested in boats? <laughs> Maybe from all those boat toys. I had a few boat toys as a kid. Some wooden model that I used to play with in the bathtub, wasn't it? <laughs> But I used to draw boats as a kid too, didn't I? Mm -hmm. The first boat I worked on was a boat from Johan Anka, a Norwegian builder and designer who was an Olympic sailor. He's known for his nice lines. His boats are beautiful. First week was tough. I kind of took it with a grain of salt, thinking it's all good. Whatever I get, I'll just embrace it. Marnix picks me up from Schiffel Airport in Amsterdam, brings me down to Zutemir, and the more the roads got nearer, the more I saw sheep and the cows, and I had to kind of go, where are you? Like, I was thinking, are we going to a farmhouse? So I thought he lived in a farmhouse, and I thought, I'm going back home in a week. Like, I'll give it a, a week. After the jet lag, I was still high energy because love is a great thing. Him asking me to come over here and live with him meant letting go of everything. All my friends, they go, well, there's Courtney Ann. She's fleeing the country. You know, why would she depend on a man so much? And for me, my answer was that full-heartedly, I believed in what we could achieve, and I had to give it a chance. I came here to this small progressive country for a reason. I want to be with him, and things will be better if I'm with him, and we can do things together. For us to know each other's differences now and to try to embrace that, that makes all the difference. My first job in Germany was at McDonald's in Bochum. I would not have ever imagined 10 years ago that I would be so happy to get a job at McDonald's. But when I got that phone call, I really was happy. There are all these non-German people working there and a few Germans, but mostly non-Germans and felt like being in some sort of a international train station or something with people from different countries all over the place. And it, yeah, it was really fun talking with them and sharing stories and finding out what life is like for them back in their home country. And having worked at McDonald's, I can sympathize with the Mexicans coming to the United States and doing whatever they can do to make money. So living here has really opened my eyes towards language and how important it is, actually. And it's pretty embarrassing meeting other Americans who have lived here for, <laughs> for 10 years or whatever and still can't speak German. My own German is not perfect either. <laughs> my grammar is not too good. So if someone was to become fluent conversational Dutch, you would start off listening through TV, watch movies, have everything on a Dutch subtitle. To start off watching Sesame Street, baby books, comic books, starting those small ways. I only really started getting comfortable with speaking German recently, maybe last year or so, is when I just talked without worrying about making mistakes. And the most important thing is to not to be too self-conscious when you're speaking. People, of course, notice your mistakes, but they don't care and they don't hold it against you. Practice as much as you can. I would say every two days, like at least four hours. 
I would recommend not using your partner. Whoever you're with, your second date you're on or the third date and you fall in love, you're always going to have the same language. It just makes sense. Um, so I would take somebody other than your partner. If you can take a class, great. One-on-one -on -one is even better instead of a huge class. One-on-one -on -one is great because they can really hear your accent. I still stick out like a sore thumb <laughs> and I'm still a, an American to other people, but I definitely feel European. For example, people walking on the right side of the sidewalk. In the United States, you just walk wherever there's space. Sort of like how ants find their way around and nobody bumps into each other. But in Germany, you have the rule that everybody should walk on the right side of the sidewalk, just like you drive on the right side of the road. When I first came here, I didn't follow that rule and just walked wherever, which meant that I was basically dodging people the whole time. I would have to jump out of their way. But then I realized that everybody was trying to walk on the right side. So now I do that too. But then if somebody is coming uh, in my lane, then I'll kind of get pissed and not <laughs> move my path either, even if it's like an old lady or something. To completely be open-minded and not question things because I was just a wreck at the beginning, just especially the first six months, just questioning everything. Now I bite my tongue more and I've realized, in a way I feel European. One of the big things I've learned is that you need to hold your fork and knife at all times. We Americans put our knife down and we just eat with our fork, and that's considered improper here. The streets are twice as small as in the United States. They can't afford to have a car, and there's no space to park your car. But the public transportation is great in the big cities, so you don't even have to have a car. Europeans are tolerant, they're liberal, they don't like to talk about religion as much. You don't bring those up on a first dinner conversation. You should observe more to become European. You should observe, reflect upon that, sleep on it for about a week. A lot of people won't give you a big hug and how are you? So you do a kiss on each cheek three times. And even if it's a stranger, you, say, you, do, you kiss three cheeks. You don't leave the house without makeup on if you're a girl because otherwise you look like a bum. And even the bums are, are better dressed in Germany than the normal people are in the United States. <laughs> You'll spend a bunch of money on a sweater, not necessarily because it's a brand name, but because it's good quality and it'll last a long time. I was buying cheap Birkenstocks, and they have a saying in the Dutch language, hoot kopen is neat kopen. The cheaper the product is, becomes more expensive over time. If you think it's great, you're saving money by buying the cheaper brand, you end up spending more because if something happens to it, you have to get another pair. The most important lesson that I learned was that you can't listen to what people say and you just got to keep on pushing through to the end. These interviews were recorded in Germany and the Netherlands in September 2010 and May and June 2011. Special thanks to Ryan and Courtney Ann. I hope there are many other insights as Americans living in Europe will find their way into future productions. It doesn't matter where you are or what you do or how much money you make, love will conquer in the end.